All right, so the first thing I'd like you to do is to click on the ACT reflection assignment in your resources folder on Schoology. I put it here just hopefully to make it a little bit easier to find. And then write down your ACT English Passage 1 realistic and extended time scores on page 1. So you will have to go back and if you um, submitted this uh, English test on Schoology, then you'll have to go back, click on the actual assignment, then click on your submission, and you'll see um, that I annotated on it, so I marked down which ones are wrong. And then if you can't find it, please let me know. If you did this on paper, then um, I will give the paper copy back to you. Um, so page one, you're going to put down um, how many you got right within the time limit. And that's the first number that I write down. If I write down like six versus six, it's the first number. And then the second number is how many you got right with all the time you needed. So sometimes this is the same, especially if you didn't indicate to me that you finished um, them all in nine minutes. So just make sure that going forward, you star any that you answer after nine minutes, but um, you answer all of them. Like, so don't leave any blank, answer all of them. Because otherwise this extended time score I can't really do because you didn't try on all of them. So I don't know what you're capable of. Um, so fill in that first page first. The ACT English test is the first test on the ACT and you'll have 45 minutes to answer 75 questions. Um, out of those 75, seven to 11 of them will be punctuation questions. So it's gonna test um, if you know how to use commas, apostrophes, colons, semicolons, dashes, etc. 11 to 15 of the questions um, are going to be about grammar, so subject verb agreement, uh, pronoun agreement, etc. 15 to 19 of the questions are going to be about sentence structure, so um, like sentence fragments, run ons, like understanding dependent clauses, comma splicing. Uh, looking for shifts in verb tense or shifts in like pronoun person or number. Um, 11 to 15 of the questions will be about strategy, so like adding, revising, deleting, um, how a sentence fits with the purpose, the audience, the focus of a paragraph or the essay as a whole. 7 to 11 of the questions will be about organization, so openings, transitions, closing phrases, uh, the order things should um, go in. Uh, and the focus of sentences and paragraphs. And then lastly, 11 to 15 of the questions will be about style. So uh, things like tone, clarity, uh, eliminating ambiguity, uh, wordiness, uh, redundant material, like do we really need that? Because it's kind of saying the same thing that's already been said. Uh, and just clarifying things that are vague or awkward. Um, so the great news about the ACT English test is that um, it's not an IQ test. You, If you score poorly, all that means is that you haven't learned those rules yet, okay? But you can, okay? It's all about rules and just take them one at a time. So on passage one, um, here are uh, the answers are in red and then the the kind of rules each question is like is testing. So question one is testing, do you know how to use commas? Two is testing your grammar. Three is ambiguous pronouns. Four, dashes and semicolons. Five, question five is uh, testing, like do you understand the purpose of a sentence? Six is commas with fanboys. Seven is word choice. What's the best choice for like best word to go here? Eight is testing grammar, nine is word choice, 10 is commas before prepositions, 11 is a topic sentence, 12 periods and comma splicing, 13 is testing commas and semicolons, 14 is testing apostrophes, and 15 is testing writer's purpose. So they, every question has a goal, or sometimes it has like multiple goals on things that it wants to see if you know. And all of these things can be learned. So I would just recommend pick one, like if you're, um, like able and willing to uh, do some independent study and be like, you know what, I'm going to learn how to use dashes and use YouTube videos and use Google and do practices um, and really, really get yourself confident in those and then go on and pick something else.
All right, so on page two of your ACT reflection document, I want you to highlight the types of questions that you got wrong. If you didn't finish the test, it's a really good idea to finish it first. Uh, so this is as accurate as possible and try not to like look at the right answers. Um, so um, go through, highlight them. Um, if you didn't answer the question, it's kind of hard like because you can highlight it, but then maybe you would have got it right. So I just recommend finishing the test first and then doing the highlighting. All right, so now what I want you to do is look at your realistic score versus your extended time score. And you're gonna pretend that you scored the exact same on each of the five passages. You're not writing this down anywhere, just do it in your head uh, and, or on a calculator. Multiply your realistic score by five and then use this number and the next slide to help you determine what your ACT English score would be, like what you're kind of on track to get, okay? Um, so like, let's say you got, um, I don't know, what do we want to say? You got five, right? Is that what we want to say? And then we're going to multiply it five by uh, 20. Rewind. Okay, so let's say you got five right out of 15 on passage one, okay? Uh, we're going to multiply that by five because we're pretending you get five right on all five passages, okay? And so that would be 25 right out of 75. So you'd be on track to score an 11 on the ACT English section. Um, like, let's say you got 10 right on passage one. Multiply that by five, thinking that you might get 10 right on each of the five passages, and that would be 50. So then you'd be on track to get a 21 on the English section of the ACT. Okay? Um, so... Take a minute and do that, kind of get a ballpark. All right, so question one, um, like I said, if you haven't already, like try this before you listen to the answers. So, um, and actually listen to the answers because um, it will, and I would even take some notes perhaps like at the end of the reflection document on things like rules just to kind of remember or to go back and look into. So question one, um, it says, it slithers through the forest like a snake curving and bending along the banks of the river. Now, this comma is not correct, okay, because um, it has a fanboy, and it's a fanboy. The fanboys are for and nor, but, or, yet, so. Um, but what comes after the fanboy is not a complete sentence, okay? Um, and you would have to have a complete sentence after the fanboy to need that comma there. So this one's not right. Um, B so you would read it, it slithers through the forest like a snake, comma, curving and bending along the banks of the river. Now B is actually correct, and the reason why it needs a comma here um, is because the sentence could end after snake and still make sense. So it slithers through the forest like a snake. So what comes after that, curving and bending along the banks of the river, isn't needed, um, and so you would put a comma there. Um, this is just way too comma happy. Yeah, we don't need all those commas. You don't, yeah. So, all right, question two. The country cleared this path and paved it with packed gravel. So they would have a peaceful place to hike and bike. So which of the following alternatives to the underlined portion would not be acceptable? So you have to pick the wrong answer now. The country cleared this path and paved it with packed gravel. That makes sense, okay? So that one's fine. Um, Oh, except that's not an option, sorry. Uh, the country cleared this path, paving it with packed gravel. Uh, perfect, and we know that this is correct, um, this comma here, because you could read the sentence without um, what comes after it. The country cleared this path, boom, done, right? Paving it with packed gravel is just added information. Um, this one, the country cleared this path, and then paved it with packed gravel, that makes sense, like they did this first and then that second. The country cleared this path um, before paving it with packed gravel, that makes sense as well. Um, the country cleared this path, paved it with packed gravel, no. So this is just a grammar, um, this one just doesn't make sense. Question three, the country cleared this path and paved it with packed gravel so they would have a peaceful place to hike and bike. Now, this one is an ambiguous pronoun. Uh, they, we have no idea who they are, right? Um, so you're going to, 
that's the problem. So B can't be right, C can't be right, A can't be right, because we don't know who, like, who this is or who they are. So you need to replace it with people to get clear, like, have some clarity. The country cleared this path and paved it with pack gravel so people would have a peaceful place to hike and bike. All right, question four. I ride this trail ne nearly every day, not on a bike, but on a, but on Luigi. Um, okay, so um, right now, um, this one right here, I ride this trail nearly every day, semicolon doesn't work. Um, and the reason why is a semicolon, you need to have a complete sentence on both sides and not on a bike, but on Luigi isn't a complete sentence. Um, and so this semicolon also wouldn't work because but on Luigi is also not a complete sentence. Um, so then you're between F and H. I ride this trail nearly every day, not on a bike, but on Luigi. Um, the correct answer is F. Okay. Um, typically, I mean, I like to put dashes before not. You don't always do them, but, but you can. Um, the reason why this one is a little bit confusing um, is because typically you can't have a comma uh, before a fanboy, or you don't have a comma before a fanboy if you don't have a complete sentence on both sides. Um, but in this case, they like that one the best. Um, so, that's about as good as I've got for that one. All right, question five. That's the nickname I gave my motorized wheelchair. So, if the writer were to delete the preceding sentence, so pre, okay, learning like your suffocate, your suffix, suffix says, there we go, um, means before, okay, the essay would primarily lose Okay, so when it says proceeding, it means the sentence before this, okay? So if you took that out, I ride this trail nearly every day, not on a bike, but on Luigi. Today, Luigi's battery. Okay, so this sentence right here is what, like, tells us who Luigi is, right? And Luigi is his motorized wheelchair. So if you took that sentence out, uh, you wouldn't lose a reason why the narrator's in the forest, uh, you would lose a detail that's important for understanding the essay because otherwise you have no idea that Luigi is a wheelchair, right? So B is the correct answer. Um, all right, six. Today, Luigi's battery is fully charged. I know I can go all the way to the end of the trail and back. Now, what we have here is comma splicing, so you can't put a comma in between two complete sentences, okay? Luigi's battery is fully charged. It's a complete sentence, it needs a period, right? Or it needs some, like a fanboy after it. I know I can go all the way to the end of the trail and back. It's a complete sentence. You can't put a comma in between two complete sentences if you don't have a fanboy after it. So F is definitely not right. G, today Luigi's battery is fully charged. Because of that, I know I can go all the way to the end of the trail and back. It's still not okay. First of all, we don't ever put a comma or like, 99% of the time, a comma does not go before because. Um, maybe all of the time. Um, it depends if you had like paired commas. So, sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, that one doesn't work because, because, if you had because of that, I know I can go all the way to the end of the trail and back, is a complex sentence. And so you would have a simple sentence followed by a complex sentence, and they both make sense on their own, so we would still have a comma splice here. That would still be comma splicing. This would still be comma splicing too, because this means that I know I can go all the way to the end of the trail and back, is still a complete sentence. Um, it also gets a little bit wordy. You don't need, you don't need all that. Um, and so J is definitely the correct answer because if you add a fanboy here, uh, then the sentence is perfect. So you put a comma before a fanboy, and so is a fanboy, um, when you have a complete sentence on both sides. All right, question seven. Luigi's motor moves slowly as we venture along the trail. Which choice would most logically and effectively emphasize the positive, friendly attitude the narrator has toward Luigi? So we're looking for something positive and friendly. We've got move slowly, travel safely, 
proceeds carefully and purrs softly. Well, purrs makes me think of like a, like a nice little kitty, right? And so purrs softly is going to be uh, the choice that is the most positive and the most friendly. So Luigi's motor purrs softly as we venture along the trail. Uh, number eight. I hear the songs of cardinals in the trees and the clamor of crickets in the grasses. That makes sense. You can hear the songs of cardinals in the trees and the clamor of crickets in the grasses. That also makes sense, but the problem with the G is that you've changed from first person I to second person you. Okay, so that one can't be right because you've got a change in like speak, like, yeah. Um, H, one can even hear the songs of cardinals in the trees. Again, same thing, it makes sense, but you're changing from I to one, so from first person to third person. And then J, if you said, well, hearing the songs of cardinals in the trees and the clamor of crickets in the grasses, you actually have a dependent clause. Okay, that doesn't make sense on its own. It's like you need a comma and something after it for that to make sense. So the correct answer on eight is F because it's just perfect how it is. All right, nine. It is September and some of the trees are starting to blush red and orange at their tips. Um, that makes sense. Um, due to the fact that it is September and some of the trees are starting to blush red and orange at their tips doesn't because if you add due to the fact of that, you're, now you have a dependent clause because it doesn't make sense on its own. You would need something coming after orange at their tips, okay? Due to the fact that it is September and some of the trees are starting to blush red and orange at their tips, what? Uh, it turns into the month of September and some of the trees are starting to blush red. Well, there's no evidence that it's turning to the month of September. Um, and like if you, at Luigi's Rubber, I hear the murmur of water slipping over time smooth rocks. It is September and some of the trees are starting. So yeah, I mean, you don't want to change... Like, we don't know that it's August, and then it turns to September. We don't want to change, like, the meaning of the text. Um, 10, or sorry, D, uh, because it has turned into September, and some of the trees are starting to blush red and orange at their tips. That one doesn't work either, because now you've got a dependent clause. You would need a come after tips, and you would need something else for that sentence to make sense. So what we're going to start working on... Um, is knowing the difference between a dependent clause and an independent clause. A clause, like... Uh, a clause that makes sense on its own and one that doesn't. All right, so the correct answer on nine is A. 10, uh, the wind ruffles my hair and chills my face as I bounce gently along in my padded chair. So uh, you actually don't need a comma before a prepositional phrase. Um, so the correct answer is gonna be H. Uh, the wind ruffles my hair and chills my face as I bounce gently along in my padded chair. So um, along is a preposition. And if you have a prepositional phrase, like at the end of your sentence, you don't need a comma before it. So uh, F would be wrong, G would be wrong, and then uh, this one would be wrong too. Uh, you just There's no reason to put a comma right there. Um, so the correct answer is H. You just don't need one at all. 11. Bicyclists streak past in a blur of color and a cloud of dust. Which choice most effectively leads into the new subject of this paragraph? Um, well, uh, the sun begins to set in a blur of color and a cloud of dust. I don't understand their hurry. Okay, it's not about the sun. And then I don't understand their hurry doesn't make any sense. Same with nature. Um, because then who's there, right? If you, if you take that out, it's, there is referring to the bicyclist. Oh, I can't say that word. <laughs> bicyclist. Uh, and then same with days. So you really need bicyclist because, um, that's what the paragraph is about. And you would have some ambiguity, like you would lack clarity if you took that out and tried to replace it with something else. 12, um, bicyclists streak past in a blur of color and a cloud of dust. That's a complete sentence. It makes sense on its own. I don't understand their hurry. That's a complete sentence. It makes sense on their own. So something else that you can't do um, is have two complete sentences with nothing in between them, right? So F is not right. You can't 
put a comma there, okay? Because then that would be comma splicing. A comma doesn't go in between two complete sentences. And you can't even do a comma in however because however is not a fanboy, okay? Fanboys are for and nor, but, or, yet, so. So if you put a comma before however, uh, and there's a complete sentence on both sides, which there is, um, you have comma splicing again, which is bad. ACT will definitely ask comma splicing multiple times. So the correct answer is H. You just need a simple period in between those two complete sentences. 13. Uh, Susan's by the barbed wire fence is starting to dry and fade away. I spend an hour looking and listening and learning. That semicolon can't be right because looking and listening and learning is not a complete sentence. Okay. Um, B. I spend an hour, comma, looking, comma, and listening and learning. No, just too many commas, right? And also, you can't, you wouldn't put a comma before that looking because you'd need it. I spend an hour doing what, right? You need what you spend an hour doing, so you wouldn't put a comma before that. Unlike the first question where you didn't need what came after, um, what was the first question? Okay, oh yeah, you didn't need the curving and bending along the banks of the river. It slithers through the forest like a snake, makes sense on its own. I spend an hour doesn't make sense on its own. Like, what do you spend an hour doing? So you wouldn't do a comma there because you need what comes next. Uh, semicolon can't go here because and listening and learning doesn't, it's not a complete sentence. So the correct answer is just there's no punctuation there. D. All right, question 14. Um, is testing your use, like, do you know how to use apostrophes? So I leave the trail and come out into the open manicured park at the trail's end. Um, so this doesn't work um, because this is possessive and belongs to the trail. It's the trail's end. So we're going to need an apostrophe. Um, this is there's one trail. This is there's more than one trail, right? And because it says the trail right above it, we know there's only one. So we know it can't be F because it needs an apostrophe. It can't be H um, because um, there's only one trail. And then this one just uh, just doesn't make sense. You wouldn't you you wouldn't do that. The only reason why you would have S apostrophe S is if it was like a name, like James's, right? Like if the word just naturally ends in an S and then you're trying to make it possessive, which this one doesn't. Um, so the correct answer is G. All right, so question 15. Um, so 15 asks, asks about the preceding passage as a whole. So um, everything we've just read from questions 1 to 15. Um, suppose the writer's goal had been to write an essay illustrating the pleasure that people can take in nature. Would this essay accomplish that goal? Um, so let's go back and um, skim through. So first we see uh, that it describes the trail. Um, and then we see um, that it's a nice place to hike and bike. We see that the narrator is uh, in a wheelchair on this trail. Um, he carries a cell phone. Okay, now we can see, or now we, here, here's where we really get our, our answer. So he hears the songs of cardinals in the trees and the clamor of crickets, the murmur of water slipping over the rocks. Uh, some of the trees are starting to uh, blush red and orange at the tips. Um, the wind, um, he doesn't like their hurry. He wants to go slowly. Um, he spends an hour looking and listening and learning. Um, so do we feel he returns to the world of pavement? So do we feel that he has written an essay illustrating the pleasure that people can take in nature? Yes, because it focuses on a variety of wildflowers. No, it doesn't. Yes, because it focuses on the narrator's joy at having access to nature. I think so. Uh, no, because it describes the world of the city as being more important to the narrator. It never does that. And no, because it focuses primarily on the functioning of the narrator's motorized wheelchair. No, it only tells you once that that's what he's in. He's not walking. He's not biking. Um, 
So hopefully that helped. Hopefully you learned at least a little bit. Um, and going forward, when you get asked um, some of the or some questions that where these rules apply, hopefully you won't get them wrong a second time, or you'll just feel more confident.